of this month, but it also reflects our mutual desire to embrace a new stage of our relationship, one that will be guided by the Strategic Framework Agreement, again referenced by my colleagues. The Strategic Framework Agreement, which calls for broad cooperation across a wide range of areas of policy, including democratic institutions and diplomatic relations, trade and finance, energy, services, law enforcement and the judiciary, and culture and education, and which, unlike our security agreement, does not expire. The significance of this agreement lies not in just what it states, but what it stands for. It stands for a fundamentally different type of relationship, grounded in civilian cooperation between equal sovereigns. It means an opportunity to help a new Iraqi democracy secure its place in the community of responsible nations. It means America will remain deeply engaged here in Iraq and throughout the region. A comprehensive relationship in which we are building that will include security cooperation, a standard feature of our relations with many countries, including the training on the military equipment that we will sell to this sovereign nation. In that effort, we'll be building on a strong foundation. The deep ties that were forged in battle that made Iraq one of the ten largest purchasers of U.S. military equipment and the fourth largest in the region. And we'll continue to assess, to assess Iraq in other areas when asked where we've made commitments, such as helping those displaced by war inside Iraq and in neighboring countries. Yesterday, Prime Minister Maliki and I chaired a meeting of the Higher Coordinating Committee, a body created by the Strategic Framework Agreement and charged with overseeing the important work of bringing this new relationship to life. This is a young population in Iraq. Over 50 percent of Iraq's population is under the age of 20. And I say to you, American warriors, and to you, Iraqi soldiers, because of the progress that you have made, that young generation will not have to suffer the same indignities and deprivations that plagued their parents and their grandparents. That is an incredible accomplishment. And it's due to the work of so many of you in this room, and also the hundreds of thousands of others who walked in your boots and in your shoes. I've been coming here for a long time, close to 20. The change has been stark since my first visit. I don't need to remind any of you assembled in this palace it was only a few years ago that hundreds of bodies a day piled up in the morgue in Baghdad, that a bullet slipped in an envelope and slid under the door became an unmistakable signal to abandon your home or else, that highways had become minefields and the daily commute was a test of your faith. If you knew Iraq back then, as so many of you in this room did, and as I saw in my so many visits here, then you'd know how incredibly far we have come and why the cynics 
should not doubt how much further you will move. One, statistics one statistic illustrates this progress. In 2007, Iraqis suffered 1,600 violent incidents per week. Today, because of your work, that number is under 100 incidences per week. More than there should be, but more than a tenfold decrease. And it wasn't luck. It wasn't an accident. It was the sacrifice and bravery and professionalism of all of you assembled before me in uniform that made it possible. And it will not and should not be forgotten, either in Iraq or in my home country of the United States of America. What you all know is that it doesn't mean that the threats are over. Far from it. Violent extremists continue to launch appalling attacks against innocent civilians, fire deadly rockets at diplomats merely trying to do their job, and threaten Iraqi troops and police who are sworn to protect their own people. But Iraqi security forces have been well trained, prepared, and you are fully capable of meeting the challenge. And Iraq's emerging, inclusive political culture will be the ultimate guarantor, the ultimate guarantor of this stability. When we announced this way forward in October, there were those who charged that America was abandoning in Iraq and that one of two outcomes would result. You've heard it and I've heard it. Either Iraq would slide back into ethnic or sectarian war, or that other countries in the region would unwelcomingly fill the vacuum. In my view, in the President's view, those arguments are not only misunderstand the Iraqi politics, but they underestimate the Iraqi people. First, the lesson of the last few years in Iraq is that while there remain strong disagreements over matters of policy, Iraqis' leaders are opting for political solutions, not violence. I've said many times, and some of my friends in the front row have heard me say it time and again, and it's often overlooked, an overlooked development in Iraq. Politics has broken out. Politics has become the dominant means of settling disputes and advancing interest. And as you have all learned in all democracies, politics is sometimes messy, not just in Iraq. And as President Obama and I have said early in our administration, the pursuit of perfection should not stand in the way of advancing achievable goals continually. Disputes are now settled within the bounds of acceptable give and take, and that's a huge and necessary step forward. The second point is that we learned over more than eight years in Iraq that this country's independent, patriotic spirit is stitched into its national fabric. The Iraqi people will not, have not, and will not again yield to any external domination. And they would never abide another nation violating their sovereignty by funding or directing militias that use Iraqi terrain for proxy battles to kill innocent Iraqi civilians. That's why I'm confident. President Harry Truman once described the end of war, and I quote, as a solemn but glorious hour. Honoring those who fought this war also requires us to remember all that was lost. 
more than one million Americans, and if we excuse the personal reference, including my son, served on this soil. 4,486 of your comrades, 4,486 fallen angels have made the ultimate sacrifice, and more than 30,000 were wounded, many of whom, because of the advanced medical care, survived trauma that would have killed men and women in the earlier wars of this nation, and now